Bloodhound is designed to travel at 1,000 miles per hour. Now that's faster than the speed of sound, which makes things really interesting from an aerodynamics point of view, because we're going to be generating things called shock waves. Now at the nose of the car, we'll be generating the first shock wave the car will experience. It's called the bow shock. And it basically exists because the air hasn't had enough time to move out of the way of the car, to get around the car, so it has to suddenly compress. That compression causes a pressure increase, and a temperature increase. So we anticipate that the nose of the car will get to about or just over 100 degrees centigrade at top speed. So as we move down the nose of the car, we get to the front wheels. And again, because they cause an obstruction to the flow, there will be more shockways forming ahead of these front wheels. Now, if you compare the, the shape of Bloodhound with Thrust SSC, which was much wider, that generated very strong shockwaves that caused real problems, particularly in terms of fluidizing the surface that the car was running across. Now, the design of Bloodhound is far more slender and streamlined to try and minimize the strength of those shockwaves. So we're hoping that we're not going to see anything like those extreme effects that we saw on the Thrust project. As we move further along the car, we arrive at the cockpit canopy that covers Andy Green, leading up to the jet intake. Now this is really interesting because the intake to a jet engine wants the flow to be coming into it at about 500 or 600 miles an hour, much slower than the speed out here in the free stream, which might be at 1,000 miles an hour. So the job of this geometry on the car, even the cockpit canopy itself, is to generate a set of shockwaves that decelerates the flow of the air from 1,000 miles per hour out here down to about five or 600 miles an hour here. So that deceleration effect is happening over a space of just about one and a half meters. So as we get to the rear of the car, we get to the rear wheels. Now these wheels are rotating at 10,000 revolutions per minute, which makes the wheels actually simultaneously the fastest and slowest part of the car. Because at the top of the car, as that wheel rotates round, the top of the wheel is actually traveling forwards at 2,000 miles an hour. And then as the, the wheel rim rotates round to the, the bottom and touches the surface, instantaneously the bottom of the wheel is actually stationary. Now, in fact, we think that at the top speeds of the car, in fact, the wheel won't be rotating at exactly the same speed that the car is traveling at because there'll be some slippage between the wheel itself and the ground. And that begs the question, well, how do we know how fast the car is traveling? So we can measure, there's another way of measuring the speed using a pitot tube. So on the fin, we've got a pitot tube mounted facing forwards. And basically what that is doing is measuring the pressure of the air that's being forced into that tube. And from the measurement of that pressure, you can then calculate how fast the car is moving through the air itself. But you still have a bit of a problem because if you have wind gusts, that affects the reading on the pitot tube. So in fact, the speed that's measured on the pitot tube could be 20 miles per hour, 30 miles per hour, different to the actual speed of the car across the ground. So the most accurate way of us to actually measure the speed of the car across the ground is to use GPS. So the Rolex Speedo inside the cockpit uh, of Bloodhound is GPS controlled, but we'll be using a much more accurate GPS system than the kind of GPS system you would use on your mobile phone. And that's because we've got to get this really accurate because the car will be covering a mile every three and a half seconds at a thousand miles per hour.